Hi everyone, welcome to Teaching Nonviolent Atonement. My name is Adam Erickson. I'm Suzanne Ross. And we are here with uh, Richard Shank, whom you can see crystal clear right there in the middle of the screen, and with uh, Jay Alberg, who is right now, unfortunately, a white cartoon character. <laughs> yes. But uh, we are trying to figure out how to get Jay's image up on the screen, uh, but uh, he may just stay a white cartoon character, and we're, we're okay with that. Yeah. I think we'll try to figure it out, but if that's the best we can do, we'll go from there. Um, so, um, yeah, welcome everyone. Yeah, and Jay's, yeah, Jay's a surprise guest, and we will introduce him momentarily. Um, maybe first we'll do a quick calendar update. Excellent, And that then get awesome. into uh, meeting Richard and uh, talking about battling to the end. Excellent. So, um, coming up, friends, on um, our live chats next week, February 13th, we'll be discussing the lectionary with Reverend Paul Le Nectarline. Um, and the following week, we have um, Nadia Bowles Weber um, joining us. She is going to be here on Tuesday rather than Thursday, so watch for that. It'll be Tuesday, February 18th, and we'll be discussing her book, Pastrix, and in particular, looking at um, the direction that Christianity is going in today, and in particular, um, how uh, to form community. We've been trying to get Nadia on the chat for a while now, and one of the things that we're excited about is that Nadia has been influenced by mimetic theory through James Allison. So we'll talk with her about James and mimetic theory and see sure. how uh, mimetic theory can help um, in direct the future of the church. That's what we're hoping that, for. That'll be fun. We're hoping yeah. for that kind of impact. Yeah. And then in um, March, we're going to have... Um, the first week of March, on March 6th, James Warren has a new introduction to mimetic theory that came out last year called Compassion or Apocalypse, and Jim's going to be with us to discuss that and to kick off the month of March um, on a theme of scandal. Ooh. We're kind of, we're playing with the idea of doing um, themes for yeah. the month so that the conversations, there's Jay all the way from Japan. Awesome. Well, that had a ricochet around the moon and back again, and so here he is. So that's great. Um, but so for March, we're going to start out with the theme of scandal and have Jim give us a good introduction to what mimetic theory says about that very important concept in Renee's thinking. Um, and we also then will be wrapping up the month with Jeremiah Alberg's book, which also came out last year. If you're a member of Cover, you received this incredible book already, Beneath the Veil of the Strange Verses. Um, this is reading scandalous texts. It's an amazing book. I was ha lucky to interview Jay when um, we were both at the Cover Conference in Iowa um, last summer, so we've got a recording of Jay talking about the book a little bit. So that'll be fun. We'll post that in anticipation of of him coming on to talk about the book. But he's here with us to talk with Richard because they're friends and they are. Richard is soon to join um, the ranks of, of hosts of cover conferences, um, which Jay hosted a few years ago. Richard, you've never hosted one before, have you? I think I did in 2011 in Berkeley on Gerard and World Religion. That's right. You hosted a conference at Berkeley. That was a that was an Imitatio conference, right? It was, yeah. yeah it it was. was that was that was a great conference, actually. Um, but right now, you are here um, wearing a number of hats as the host of this year's cover conference, which will be um, at or near your <laughs> university outside Munich, and. Um, where is my... Richard, uh, as okay. Suzanne is looking for that, can you pronounce the name of your university? Because <laughs> I was stumbling the whole way through. Uh, the university is located on two campuses, and it bears the name of both campuses in its name. It's called the Catholic University of Eichstätt, Ingolstadt. It's in the two cities. So one is called Eichstätt a small uh, city of only about 14,000 persons, 
and Ingolstadt, which is a larger city of about 110,000 persons, and uh, the university is on these, in these two places, about a half an hour from each other, about an hour to the north of Munich. Okay. Yes, and you are currently president of the Catholic University of those two beautiful cities, um, and you are a Roman Catholic priest of the Order of Preachers, otherwise known as the Dominicans, um, and you have um, had a, well, I, one, one thing I want to ask you, Richard, first is how you ended, ended up in Germany as president of the Catholic University there. You were born in uh, uh, the United States, were you not? I would call it that, beautiful downtown Burbank, which uh, I do believe Burbank. is part of the United States. Uh, and um, I was. And I uh, did my initial studies in California at Santa Barbara and then in Berkeley at the Graduate Theological Union. And I went from there to Munich and did my own uh, doctoral studies in Munich and then uh, continued on working in Germany for a while before going back to Berkeley. And then back to Germany. <laughs> and then back to Germany again, yes, right. There's a, there's a, um, this university in Eichstätt, Ingolstadt, is uh, the only Catholic university in Germany or in any, in any German-speaking country. It's not otherwise a custom. But it's a bit of an experiment that's been going on for some 35 years. And so I get to uh, shepherd it through these five years or so of its history. Wow. How's the experiment going so far? Well, so far, so good, I would say. But that's, you know, uh, it's also what the optimist said when he fell off the cliff halfway down. So far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> so, Richard, when did you encounter mimetic theory? I um, first bumped into it in the early 90s. Uh, I was the director of a small think tank in northern Germany, in Hanover. And that think tank had a wonderful um, little academy of about 20 to 25 of the leading thinkers of Germany, not just philosophers, but also from uh, neighboring disciplines, sociology, history, medicine, and so on. And we put on a conference in the early 90s, and it came out as a book in 1995. It looked like this, which you can't quite see, I don't think. But it's uh, called On the Theory of Sacrifice, an Interdisciplinary Discourse. And uh, René Girard was a common theme in many of the presentations. And so I, in that way, I first uh, came to know something of Girard. And then an important second step in those years, I was going back and forth between uh, Germany and Berkeley. And when I was back in Berkeley, uh, teaching at the Graduate Theological Union. There was a professor nearby, a certain Jeremiah Alberg, who was uh, part of uh, René Girard's ongoing doctoral and postdoctoral uh, seminar. And he had the crazy idea to drag me along a few times. And so that was my first personal meeting with René Girard. Nice. It was in the late, late 90s through Jeremiah Alberg. Nice. Awesome. Well, Jay, we owe you a debt of gratitude for bringing Richard along. Yeah, I'm I'm glad he came. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, Richard, we are um, very excited that you could join us to talk about um, this year's cover conference, um, which is going to be taking up Renee's um, – most recent book, Battling to the End, um, in which he engages the um, the thinker um, Karl von Clausewitz and his treatise on war called On War. Um, and um, your, the name of the conference is called um, The Escalation of Violence and Victimization, looking at Rene Girard and Jean-Luc Marion. And it's um, the occasion of the conference um, is the 100th anniversary of the start of World War I in Europe. And battling to the end, of course, is Rene's um, foray into history and applying pneumatic theory to history, in particular the history of war and its conduct. And um, 
he, he engages with Clausewitz, and um, for those of us who are really not that familiar with the history of war and on war, um, but we all are familiar with this famous phrase from Clausewitz's book, war is the continuation of politics by other means. That's sort of a mm, pop culture phrase almost. Everybody kind of knows that. Um, but Rene was captivated by um, Clausewitz's intuition um, that politics really can no longer constrain violence, but he backed away from it apparently in On War, according to Rene, and in the shadow of um, the Napoleonic conquest of Prussia and the, um, the, the European countries at the time. Um, Clausewitz saw something uh, that frightened him, uh, apparently, according to Rene. And so what I'd like to just begin by asking you is um, if you can give us some insight into this idea that, um, that Clausewitz was dancing around, that politics can constrain war, or it should or it can't, but it can no longer, and what was fearful about that for him? Big question, but I, I would, there you go. Uh, if I can begin by pointing out that the, the main title of the conference is "Battling to the End" in quotation marks to refer to the book "Battling to the End, 1914 to 2014." Then comes the subtitle that you mentioned: "The Escalation of Violence and Victimization." Rene Girard and Jean-Luc Marion. Um, and so the, the major point of reference is, in fact, the, this wonderful book uh, by René, Babbling to the End in English, Conversations with Benoit Chantre. Benoit will also be at the conference. And in fact, it'll be the presentation of the uh, first German translation of the book. So we're presenting it to a, a German audience. You, if, you've, uh, if your readers have looked at the book, you know it begins with a, the sentence, this is a peculiar kind of book. It claims to be a study of Germany and French-German relations over the last two centuries. And that particular centuries. And that uh, rivalry between France and Germany is a, a model, if you like, of the kind of rivalries that Rene sees as uh, going on right in our times and uh, in a special way. And so we're going to I invite people to come to Germany to talk about the First World War, what it means as a key to understanding our times in general, and to do that chiefly by looking at it through this book uh, with the best Girard specialists in the world, and uh, in particular with uh, Benoit Chantre, the uh, co-author of the book, the, the one who carried on this conversation with Rene. Um, I think Rene's contribution to uh, understanding Clausewitz was that um, the, the line you mentioned is, in fact, a, a very key thesis, but it's already an attempt, and not a, 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 not a successful attempt, but a, a failed attempt to address the problem. And Rene's contribution is that he identifies that problem. And that was Clausewitz's problem, but Clausewitz doesn't dwell on the problem, but seeks somewhat desperately to find an answer. And the problem that Clausewitz saw at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century was uh, precisely uh, the escalation of violence. He was a Prussian officer. He would die around 1830, was born, was about 50 years old, just barely 50 years old. And um, so he saw this, this passing of uh, what had been a traditional Europe to becoming a Europe that was very much going to be shaped by the escalation of violence. One of the um, uh, instruments for that uh, escalation was combining professional armies and conscription armies, drafting whole populations into uh, wars. And that would, of course, make the, the uh, the war is much larger. Clausewitz saw that that was a trend that could not be reversed, and so he was worried. He had a problem. What are we going to do about the escalation of violence? And his hope was to argue for a political 
a limitation to a violence. He wanted to take violence out of the ideological and put it back into tactical political bargaining. Uh, that was, um, you know, a, a nice thought, but it wasn't going to work. And so what Rene tells us about Clausewitz is that his analysis of the problem was more lasting than his attempt somewhat desperate attempt to give an answer. To see that violence was escalating is his contribution, even if there's no way to simply put a political cap on violence. That's, in a certain sense, the, the origin of the book. Mm -hmm. So how is this, um, how are you imagining this uh, conversation to take place in the context of World War I? Because Rene does touch a little bit on um, you know, the, the future of Europe after Napoleon, um, which is now our past. But um, what, what are you imagining taking place? Well, first of all, I think it's very important to understand World War I, uh, both from a, a military point of view, but also from a cultural point of view, because World War I uh, was the first kind of um, uh, summit point for what Clausewitz had been pointing to. I mean, Clausewitz died in 1830, and of course, World War I is from 1914 to 1918. So Clausewitz could not have uh, addressed that war in particular, but the mechanisms that he mentions and that he's worried about, the escalation of violence, the tendency towards the extremes, the lack of a self-inhibition in a war which now could involve whole populations, is something that reached its first uh, high point, if you like, uh, or low point in the First World War. There were 40 nations involved in that war, which was something that had never happened before. 17 million uh, deaths in that war. And it, it took on a proportion that uh, also dwarfed the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, but Clausewitz, in fact, had seen this coming and was worried about it. And so the First World War, even in that sort of a military industrial sense, uh, and of course, it'd be important to talk about the kinds of competition and rivalry that were involved in it, in, uh, that led to the involvement of those 40 nations. Um, that was something that, um, in a certain sense, would set the stage for what has also continued in the 100 years since the outbreak of World War I. So, um, it's very uh, an important day to see that dynamic. But it also was a shift from, if you like, from the modern world to the postmodern world. Until World War I or shortly before it, there was a kind of confidence uh, that there could be progress. Maybe the Hegelian read of progress had been uh, already somewhat daunted by the lack of democratic progress that was visible around 1848 in the different uh, uprisings to protest the lack of democratic development in Europe. But a new kind of optimism had taken over, a kind of moral optimism, uh, a kind of we can, yes we can uh, mentality, a kind of trust in technology and, and in the spirit of uh, technological progress, uh, a confidence in one's own sense of civilization. Europe was very proud of itself. And in the catastrophe, which was World War I, with its um, new kind of, uh, um, new kind of uh, trench warfare, which was simply a system of uh, a war built on the principle of defense, and you just threw whole generations of kids into, uh, into an absolutely uh, invincible form of defense, and they were slaughtered in the millions, quite literally. And uh, that led to a deep crisis, certainly in Europe, but beyond it, that the whole sense of progress, which was at the heart of, uh, of modernity and of its confidence in its own uh, powers of enlightenment, it, uh, it led to a kind of doubt about all the institutions involved, political, academic, moral, ecclesial. Uh, and so it led in a certain sense, to the end of the confidence that made up the spirit of modernity and issued in, if you like, the beginning of a, 
of a period after modernity, of a postmodern period, really began with the First World War. And of course, that leads to new questions about how this period deals with violence and with the escalation of violence. But that makes World War I so terribly important. It's a watershed, sometimes called the uh, the Urkatastrophe, the uh, seminal catastrophe of uh, our times. And uh, so we want to look at that seminal catastrophe and see how it's tied to our own worries about future catastrophe. Yeah. Jay, do, do you have a comment or anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, just uh, having spent some time with Richard in Germany uh, for as an American, uh, it was the first time I realized the devastating impact of that war on on people. You know that almost every family you got to know had lost someone, an uncle or someone. One of their ancestors had died fighting in World War One. It's just a horrible, horrible experience for uh, Europe in a way that it wasn't for America, first of all, because it wasn't on our soil, but also just the, the length and everything was not near as uh, devastating. And then this is an exciting conference because right now, because of the 100th anniversary, there's so many different works coming out on it. Uh, you know, and it, it, I remember in high school studying World War One, and my basic impression was everything was going along fine. And, and then this disaster happened and we don't know why and in many ways uh there's still a lot of uh, uh a lack of clarity about it but i think this hundredth year anniversary is bringing out some very fine scholarship on the causes so this this conference will be exciting from that aspect also yeah that's that's a great point suzanne and i were talking before the chat about how our education has failed us when it comes to understanding world war one um, and Richard, you had you had brought up that historical aspect of it, uh, which which leads me to want to ask you a very complex question and have you answer it in like three to five minutes. Um, what can you give us a brief kind of history of what led to World War One? I'll I'll do my best. I have to tell you, I'm just the president of the university, which means I I only do two things. I find bright people. And I find money to let them be bright. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have to be bright. Uh, I just have to find the right people. Mm -hmm. And so I'll do my best. But one of the bright people yeah. we found for the conference, and somebody who's going to come with the help of the Raven Foundation, is the man who's considered the best uh, contemporary scholar of the First World War, Herfried Munkler from Berlin. Uh, there's a little bit of his work published in English but he keeps bringing out major books and major studies in German. There you go. That's The New Wars is an English version. His latest yeah. uh, book here is called The, the, uh, uh, the Great War, The World from 1914 to 1918. And um, certainly if you look at the – Adam, your question is about what led up to 14. Mm -hmm. And, of course – together with uh, René Girard, we can certainly say it was a pattern of rivalry, um, the kind of um, conflicts um, that were fueled and enabled by this new, new forms of industrialized warfare, warfare that involved whole populations, was um, also a, um, a, it was used as an expression of the kind of rivalry that was going on between nations. So there was a lot of uh, attempt to uh, enter into competition with one another. It was uh, a time in which the Austro-Hungarian um Empire was becoming weaker, which allowed not only for the new nations to compare themselves to the old empire, but it allowed uh, Russia and France and England to look at each other and to look at Germany and to enter into a sense of competition. Certainly the Germans were attempting to uh, to uh, meet uh, what had been done, especially by the French and the, the Brits, in terms of colonization. They wanted to begin to colonize. William II was very much concerned with expanding Germany beyond Europe. 
but that it also led to the building of a fleet, including a naval fleet, military fleet. And so there was a sense of enormous competition. It would be, by the way, the escalation of the naval war, which would bring the United States at a late time into the war in 1917, because the Germans, in order to prevent the United States from sending materials to their major rival in Great Britain, decided to resume uh, the uh, unlimited warfare on shipping and on passengers. Uh, and uh, they had agreed for a while to back off, but then they saw themselves in a situation that if they did that, they couldn't keep up the competition with Great Britain. So they reinforced submarine warfare, and that eventually brought the United States into the war because it couldn't export its own goods. It was also concerned with kind of competition in terms of uh, also production and exporting that production. So there was a lot of competition on many sides. There were the, the different kinds of secret pacts that were made in order to um, uh, ensure that one's rivals would be kept in check. And uh, that all led to a very explosive mix. Uh, and it's, you could say that was just a history that's been over, except the escalation of violence, the, the movement to the extremes, is something that has continued on for the 100 years since that war as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, I do want to like talk a little bit more about that phrase, the trend to the extremes, and, and, um, and also how, in some ways, as you were saying, Richard, seeing that lived out in the trenches of World War I, changed um, the hopefulness of the world that we could somehow master violence um, in, by staring at the fact that somehow it was mastering us in a way we hadn't anticipated. And, and even, um, you know, one of the sort of problems some people have with Renee's book is that it's, it can come across quite pessimistic, um, where he will say things like, um, well, I've got, you know, one of the quotes here. He says, of course, uh, we can all participate in the divinity of Christ so long as we renounce our own violence. However, we now know, in part thanks to Clausewitz, that humans will not renounce it. So there's this sort of, I don't know, uh, pessimism or um, uh, running through the book. And so I wondered if you could address, um, you know, the pessimism again out of this the, that's around this trend to extremes, but also Renee's pessimism, if you dare. I don't. I would. I shouldn't dare. But as long as I'm here, I might as well. I have Jeremiah Alberg here to correct me, so it's all right. Um, yeah, I like that. It's awesome. <laughs> you know, there was a very wise man who was a um, a Lutheran student uh, pastor. Uh, um, shortly before the, before the Second World War. And uh, when the National Socialists uh, took control, he wrote a, a book that was uh, meant to be a warning, uh, a book on, uh, was on a book on the Book of Apocalypse called The Last Book of the Bible. And he begins that book with a very interesting sentence, not every age is equally suited to understand the meaning of this book. And of course, what he meant was that, I think actually this book was done in, in around 1940 or so, the war had begun and the Germans were actually at that point doing very well in this Second World War. And so he was saying he didn't think that necessarily that age, which still had a sense of success, was going to understand the meaning of the Book of Apocalypse but certainly by the time it was really widely received, four years later, five years later, then people in Germany understood the meaning of that book, which was not pessimistic, but it was hope for those who had lost hope in their own sense of, of political success. Uh, certainly a, a demoralized Germany at that point, one that had experienced extreme moral failure and uh, certainly also defeat from without. And it then understood, in a certain sense, this kind of hope that is the apocalyptic hope. Apocalypse is not meant to be 
uh, really um, a lack of hope, but it's a source of hope, but it's a hope for a kind of uh, salvation that comes vertically from above because of the way in which we've gotten ourselves into a mess. Um, if you think of the apocalypse and you take away the mythological side, uh, you know, the, the book of the apocalypse just takes time out from the disasters to give you a little bit of a breathing space. You can have a new one in a certain sense. And, but the disasters it talks about are the poisoning of water and air and soil. It is uh, wars. It is an extension of disease that can't be controlled. If you take away the notion that God actually sends these things sort of out of his own making, and you see that the point of the apocalypse is that they result from human um, action, which is also in the book, and that's, that's why, in fact, they come about, then it starts to read like something that's almost a realistic analysis of what people are worried about, the escalation of violence in our time, the fact that the atomic, uh, atomic period is no longer controlled by a political uh, uh, division into blocks, uh, that atomic warfare in a certain sense is becoming available for everybody's pocketbook, um, the uh, challenges we face in terms of, of the environment and our place in it, uh, these kinds of worries that are there are not simply um, imagined, perhaps in the first apocalyptic community, which was under a lot of, or communities, which were under a lot of pressure from persecution and then the recovery from persecution, there was an attempt perhaps to think maybe God would send these kinds of uh, plagues. But we live in the first um, century or so when these worries are no longer just imagined or wished for, but are real ones. I mean, that it's not fantasized uh, disaster, but it's very real possibilities that are there. And what Rene Girard is telling us is to look at those real possibilities. There is, of course, a possibility that if you see those dangers, you'll look for a solution that's not simply a political one. Political solutions don't go deep, uh, deeply enough into the problem. And yet, you won't look for those solutions if you don't know of the danger. So what Rene Girard's book is doing is think is not I, I wouldn't bring it down to an alternative between optimism and pessimism. The only hope that is there, he's telling us, is to recognize the problem and to ask ourselves how we've contributed to it. I think that's what that's what the apocalyptic dimension of the book is about. The apocalyptic dimension is very central to the book. It's part of the German title that will be coming out. It contains this reference to apocalypse, and I think that's uh, it's an important idea. But you'd misunderstand the book, I think, if you tried to say that apocalypse uh, is uh, a form of pessimism. Apocalypse is meant, and always has been, as a form of hope, but a hope for some very worried people. And Rene Girard is saying we should be worried. In a certain sense, that's our only hope, is to be worried. Mm -hmm. uh, Jay, comment? Yeah, I, well, that was a wonderful answer. And uh, because as, as you were asking the question, uh, Suzanne, I was thinking, yeah, pessimistic or realistic, you know, and it's uh, certainly you can see in uh, Renee's thought a certain movement that becomes more worried uh, as he gets older. I think that's maybe a kind of natural movement. We all become a little bit more Augustinian as we get older. Uh, but I agree that uh, maybe it's more helpful to take off that either label, optimistic or pessimistic, and to see it uh, as a warning, but really as, as the one warning that's going to open us to the hope that's being offered to us. I like that. Uh, Richard, one of, one of the things that's going through my mind is, um, is, there, is there a, I guess, positive response that we can have to this? Is there, is there something more that we can do uh, as important as it is to acknowledge our own complicity in this? Is there, are there positive steps that we can, can move forward in? I think that um, 
Renee's work, and we're, we're going to pair him up above all with um, the work of Jean-Luc Marion, that uh, as different as these two men are in some ways, they're close enough and different enough at the same time to enter into an interesting discussion with one another. And um, I think um, what they both offer is, in fact, uh, uh, the insight that the, the very first um, way in which we can uh, move forward is to analyze how we get to the problem we're in. So what they do both offer is analysis of how um, the, the movement to the extremes, how this escalation of violence has come about. And that's the very first step to addressing it, is just to understand it. And so mimetic theory is there to offer an insight into how the escalation to the extremes takes place. And the work of Jean-Luc Marion, based around the idea of uh, recognizing the reality of gift and, and love, is there to also help us analyze how we become possessive, forget that what we have is a gift, and start to also lose love, hate others who claim our possessions. And even though it's coming with a very different set of uh, categories and problems and uh, observations than Gerard, it is certainly at the same time uh, looking at the same kind of sense of rivalry, a rivalry of possessiveness, a rivalry of those who want to, uh, who realize that they um, want to keep control of this possession because somebody else is also announcing their desire to possess what we possess. In that sense, there's a commonality between Girard and Marion. And so I think to realize that sense and ask ourselves where in our times is this sense of possessiveness personal but also national given and how can we find an alternative to this either or of rivalry and rivalry about possession. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. One of, one of the things about the book that, uh, one of the statements that Renee makes in the book that is kind of counterintuitive uh, to me that I'm hoping you might be able to help us work through is that he says things like um, that warmongering and pacifism are like mimetic doubles. And can you explain explain that to us a little bit? Like uh, the, the other thing that he says that also is counterintuitive is that the more people talk about peace, the more you should be worried that they are going to use some form of violence. Um, you know, we all want peace, uh, and so shouldn't talk about peace be a good thing? <laughs> I don't. Well, both both uh, warmongering and um, that kind of uh, pacifism uh, are based on a, a, a we-they division of the world. And uh, so it's, in a certain sense, uh, something that perpetuates the problem. Uh, it, it, it fails to see an all-encompassing kind of human community, which is what you would need to see in order to overcome uh, the basis for rivalry, and uh, in that sense, I, I think it's a good point. It's a, it's a very Girardian point. So you have to think a little bit about it, but it it does make a certain kind of sense. Uh, and uh, in a certain sense, pacifism becomes uh, an alternative. We have uh, we are the, we are the ones who like uh, peace, and they are, are different. So it's very much a we they kind of thing, you know. And usually, it, it, usually, most often, uh, you'll hear at least the, the easy form of pacifism comes from people who already are happy with their situation. Let's not change things. Let's just hope uh, the problems go away because we're quite happy. We own 90% of the world. We use 90% of its resources. We're happy with that. But let's be cool. Let's leave it that way. It's often what's behind that kind of easy pacifism. I must say, too, there are others who put their life on the line for their pacifism, and I don't really mean to uh, 
to discredit them with that comment. Yeah, no, you think of the very early Christians who refused to fight back and um, took, got their lives taken for it and refused to fight back, so yeah. Right. Well, we often talk about um, the third way, you know, Walter Wink's the third way that Jesus offered, which is a way of non-retaliation in the face of violence so as not to... Um, escalate it, not to, you know, participate in this escalation and trend to extremes. And yet, Renee is saying there's a certain way in which renunciation of violence is actually an act, can be an act of aggression. And I was, you know, these are the kinds of things that, you know, simple black and white thinkers like myself have a hard time with. You know, either you're violent or you've renounced violence and how you can renounce violence in an aggressive way. I kind of am hearing from you, Richard, a way to think about that, but um, I, I don't know what to do with it as a practice. You know, how do you practice um, non-retaliation then, which I think is what the life and death of Christ is calling us to, I think. How do you practice it in a way that is transforming of um, this, you know, typical tit-for-tat retaliatory relationship? And Jeremiah, no, I think you part of it. Jay? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. It's Richard. I'll give it a shot. Uh, and that is to say that I think you've got to look at the motivation behind non-retaliation. If non-retaliation is simply there because um, you don't really care about the other, you just want to secure your own situation, you think you can do that by avoiding getting involved. There's, there's a kind of attempt often just to stay out of these problems uh, in the hope that they'll go away or that they'll, they'll affect somebody else. Like the old joke about praying to St. Florian, who is considered patron of the fire department, dear St. Florian, protect my house, burn others down. There's a sense in which uh, uh, pacifism can sometimes be very local. I don't want to get involved. And that yeah. that would be motivated by a sense of uh, self-interest that, in fact, is part of the problem and not part of the solution. I think okay. in terms of our conference, one of the interesting contrasts between Girard and, and Jean-Luc Marion is to pick up on a, a word uh, that Jeremiah uh, just used a, a few minutes ago, we become more Augustinian with time. In a certain sense, I see Girard as being very Augustinian. I see Marion as being very uh, much in the, in the line of uh, Dionysius, the pseudo Areopagite. Those are the two major forms of Platonism that formed the uh, medieval period, uh, everyone was somehow a Platonist, but it's a question of whether you were more of an Augustinian one or more of a Dionysian one. And René is, is certainly more of an Augustinian one, Marion more of a Dionysian one, and that means that René is looking very much at the problem from the analysis of what is wrong uh, with the world and what is wrong about the way in which uh, mimesis leads to scapegoating. What is wrong about scapegoating? Marion is looking at some of the same issues around sacrifice as asking what is good, what is a kind of uh, self-liberation in terms of bringing sacrifice. Rene very much, what does it mean to suffer a sacrifice, to become the victim, and, uh, and yet... Um, uh, Marion much more asking what it would mean to, to bring that sacrifice in a, in a positive way. Um, before I go on with that, just remember, too, that this whole idea of declaring oneself self the victim is also a form of pacifism. You know, I've suffered from violence. I'm the only one here who has. You haven't. And that sort of self stylization of oneself as a victim can often be a tool and leads very quickly to aggression. Because I'm the victim, I can do anything with you. I can do anything with you I like. And that is, of course, um, one of the things that leads to the lack of self-control of violence. Once you identify yourself as a victim, there's no limit to what you might be able to do to the other. 
that's one of the ways in which I think that's one of the things that that um, uh, Rene Girard is looking at when he uses those phrases. But to come back to my basic point, we're also going to be drawing in uh, the work of another phenomenologist, uh, a Czechish uh, Czech phenomenologist who died in 1977, which I'm sure most of you know, uh, Jan Potoshka, and he has a wonderful, um, insightful essay on the First World War uh, in this collection called here, Heretical Essays in the Philosophy of History in the English version. And um, he describes also the First War as the basic event of the 20th century. And his thesis, sometimes hard to follow, uh, but it's that the best way to avoid war is to look at its evil and not to develop new strategies for optimizing the good. Because once you opt want to optimize the good, you set up the, your own uh, strategies of uh, increased possession, which will lead to war. War was only overcome if you look at the, the dark side of it. So that says that Patoshka joins Girard in being increasingly Augustinian, but that leads to the question of what what can we learn from this Dionysian tradition that Marion represents? And I think that's going to be one of the themes at the conference as well. Do you need an underlying sense of love in order to be non-retaliatory, or do you just need a sense of the evil that is there in the war if you fail to embrace a non-retaliatory uh, stance? And I think, in fact, you do need something more positive than simply we have to ask yourself, what is the motivation for being non-retaliatory? Is it just a time of preparation to really assert yourself? Or is it an attempt to draw in the other and overcome the kind of competition that is senseless and, uh, and leads to this mm -hmm. escalation of violence? Jeremiah, help me here. Well, no, I, I really do. Uh, I like what you're saying. And your last point, you know, there are a number of points along the way, but the last point is interesting, too, because... Part of the ongoing discussion in uh, cover and among Girardians is this question of the role of good mimesis uh, versus a kind of a mimetic rivalry. And a lot of, not a, there are people who would like to see more emphasis on that. And uh, there were uh, others, the famous one being uh, Bob Hammerstein Kelly that uh, would uh, rail against it. Uh, and I don't want to, uh, to denigrate because I think that what you just said at the end there about there is something uh, positive that's needed. I think maybe uh, the, the concern that people have about uh, concentrating on good mimesis is that it often seems to be just that and that it isn't this recognition of the evil. And that then I think is maybe what uh, I, I don't know uh, Pachotka's thought very well, so I can't speak to that specifically, but if that's what begins to set up then in the long run a return of what we were trying to avoid in the first place, the violence and the aggression and things like that. And so going back to Suzanne's original question, I, I think one of the things that you can look at is uh, you know, yes, I, you know, we, it's good to be for peace and it is good to uh, think about non-retaliation. But I think, as Richard was saying, as I heard him, is that one of the questions you have to ask yourself about the practice is, is it transforming yourself? In other words, you, you want to transform the world, and that's right. But in that process, in every step along the way, it seems to me it has to involve some sort of trans self-transformation, uh, some sort of conversion uh, on the part of ourselves, always on a deeper level. Can I, can I add in something that will be also a bit, of a, a bit of an advertisement, but the advertisement has a point, so be patient with me. I mentioned that the job of a president is just to find bright people and help them do their, their bright stuff. And uh, in this case, the, the bright people who are actually going to plan this conference for us uh, is, is uh, Eichstätt Walter Schweidler, who's done a lot in phenomenology, has a new series with Albert on, 
Eichstätt in phenomenology, but also um, Wolfgang Palava from the University of Innsbruck as the successor to Raimund Schwager. There'll be a Schwager memorial lecture by Marion and then uh, a student uh, essay contest winner also on uh, Schwager. And um, Wolfgang Palava is um, also someone who continues at the University of Innsbruck to do Girardian studies, and under his tutelage, a new habilitation has come out, which talks about in great detail, because only a German habilitation can, can it's a very long sort of super doctorate, um, mm -hmm. about the conversation between Girard and Schwager. And yeah. certainly, mm -hmm. Schwager helped Girard see himself how his own theory involved this kind of good mimesis, and even, even, shockingly, and hard to incorporate, but through a sense of a slightly positive side to one meaning of sacrifice, namely the willingness to become a sacrifice in order to, to overcome sacrifice, which maintains for Girard chiefly pejorative uh, connotation. But in order to overcome that, there must be a willingness to also somehow become something of a victim in order to overcome victimization. And that is uh, something that uh, Schwager and Girard worked out in a conversation. So I'm very delighted that this conference is not just the University of Eichstätt, Ingolstadt, but also the University of Innsbruck and the great contribution of uh, the brilliant Wolfgang Palaver and his, his uh, team, if you like, his, his uh, circle of students. Yeah. Wow. It does sound like a fabulous conference, and thank you for um, plugging Brave in support of one of the um, keynote addresses, because um, reading Munkler has really helped me. I, I want to go back to battling to the end now um, after having uh, as soon as I finish the new wars, and it's honestly you can't put it down. Mm. Um, it's it's an amazing um, history of warfare and uh, incredibly relevant to the contemporary uh, situation in which we find ourselves, in which these new wars, um, you know, uh, involving non-state actors have sort of taken over. And I think that's one of the exciting things about the conference, Richard, is that. Um, you know, you're looking, you know, back to Napoleon with battling Tien, but all the way up to the present and, and about why these things matter and how we can be transformative. So I want to kind of end with the uh, Chamber of Commerce pitch that you gave me a little while ago about why we should all make the trip to uh, Germany to um, participate in the conference and that what wonderful other opportunities would be available to us. Well, you remember that in Battle of the End, it begins with uh, talking about the rivalry between uh, France and, and Germany. So we're happy to be able, in a German-speaking uh, country, to invite two French thinkers uh, and their circles uh, around Girard and Marion to come and help us understand what's going on. And um, Munich is a wonderful place to do so because, first of all, culturally, it, it, in fact, began to flourish in, in a cultural way in this time just before and after the First World War. Uh, it, it itself, uh, the, the city of Munich, you have to forgive me, I'm a medievalist, the city of Munich began only in the 12th century, so we consider it an upstart anyway. But it really only took off in the 19th century as the capital of this new kingdom, which Napoleon established. So it lived for its first decades by Napoleon's graces, and then uh, though became a cultural center just before and after the First World War. And that whole sense of mm -hmm. culture around expressionism, for example, is so well documented in, in the museums of Munich. Munich is also an attempt, in a certain sense, to free itself from some of the um, despair that surrounded the First World War. It's an attempt very much uh, to find uh, an alternative to a kind of despair that could come out of uh, this experience of the problems. And whether Munich succeeds or not is another question, 
but you can come, and uh, the conference will be not right in Eichstätt, which is too small, but in Freising, which is the old Episcopal city that actually led to Munich. That's a, a long story of rivalry between the Bishop of Freising and Henry the Lion, but that's a story for another day. Um, but um, uh, that it's still called, in fact, the, 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 the Diocese of Munich Freising. Freising is about uh, less than a half an hour train ride north of Munich. Very easy to get to, by the way. You just have to fly to there. It's closer to the airport than Munich is. So you fly in the Munich airport, you jump in a taxi, and you're at the conference center. Or you take a train to Munich, and you take the little connecting train up to, to Freising, and you're there as well, which means also when you're there, you can get into Munich to see a few of the cultural expressions of reactions to this war as well, but also see the attempt to sort of swim free from uh, the Lusitania, uh, which is being sunk and dragging you down. And uh, so um, it's a great chance uh, to come to a conference. I hate to put it in this way, but it's also um, one of the uh, most financially sensible ways to visit Munich, if you like. And, um, yes. But it's also a, a great plus to understand this, the cultural impact and that, if you like, that French-German problem that became a world problem with the First World War. Well done, Richard. Yes. Thank you very much well, for having me. Thank you. It was just delightful, and we were so pleased that, Jay, you were able to join us um, in the wee hours of the wee hours from Japan. And um, we're all looking forward to talking with you next month about um, your, your wonderful book. Um, are you going to be at the cover conference, Jay? I Japan? certainly am. Yes, yes. Excellent. I'll certainly be there. And on, by the way, on the cover cover homepage, you can find the call for papers and all the details you need. Yes. Just look That's at the cover right. webpage. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Richard. Thank you both very much. And to everybody who was listening in, I know there was um, a lot of attentive listening in, and very fascinated by the conversation. So thank you both very, very much, and we'll be talking to you soon. Thanks again. Okay, thanks thank a lot. you. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.